Hi guys, sorry. Welcome everyone to part two of our four by eight bridges missions and ambitions talks, a series of live stream conversations about art in the Bay Area today. My name is Kelly Huang and on behalf of the founding committee of eight bridges, I'm excited to introduce our event this morning. We are named for the eight bridges that connect the San Francisco Bay Area. Our platform was developed to come together in these socially distant times. Traditionally, we gather at this time of year for San Francisco Arts Week a ritual established by the beloved Fog Art Fair and more recently untitled. Since we can't get together in person, we wanted to gather virtually. In that spirit, Eight Bridges is thrilled to present 36 galleries for this week-long presentation of 4x8 Bridges. 
Be sure to visit the calendar page at eightbridges.com to see the wonderful list of virtual events that have been organized for this special week. Today is the second of two sessions where we check in with local movers and shakers. I'm delighted to introduce Lauren Shell Dickens, our moderator for today's conversations. Lauren is a senior curator at the San Jose Museum of Art. Since joining the museum in 2016, she has curated solo exhibitions such as Undersoul, Jay DeFeo in 2019, Diana El Hadid, Liquid City in 2017, Withdrawn Arms, Glenn Caino and Tommy Smith in 2019, Woody De Othello, Breathing Room in 2019, and co-organized the first major mid-career survey of Rena Banerjee called Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World in 2019, which is currently on a national tour. Lauren's next project is a digital commission with Oakland-based artist Sofia Cordova, premiering on February 4th. Prior to her time at the San Jose Museum, Lauren held curatorial positions at the National Gallery of Art and the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Her public project with the Propeller Group was awarded the 2018 Creative Impact Award by the City of San Jose. And she is the 2019 Warhol Curatorial Research Fellow and a recipient of the Fellows of Contemporary Art 2022 Curators Award. Lauren will be speaking today with Sophia Canal, the lead for Phillips Auction House in the Bay Area. Phillips is an international auction house specializing in contemporary art, design, and other collectibles. Daphne Palmer, director and partner at Frankel Gallery, founded in 1979 by Jeffrey Frankel. Frankel Gallery specializes in photography and its relation to other media. Chris Perez, owner of Ratio 3, founded in 2004, Ratio 3 Gallery is a contemporary gallery in the Mission District. Elizabeth Sullivan, president of Pace Palo Alto. Pace is an international gallery with eight locations worldwide and its Palo Alto space opened in 2014 and Sarah Wendell Sherrill, co-founder and co-CEO of Lobus. Lobus consolidates objective data about the art market with sophisticated software. Lobus streamlines workflows, unlocks opportunities, and enhances productivity for everyone who interacts with art, from administrators to advisors, creators, and collectors. Lauren will speak with each of the panelists individually for about eight to 10 minutes, followed by a short Q&A session with all participants. Please pose your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the talks today. And now I'll turn it over to Lauren Shell Dickens to get our conversation started. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thank you to everyone at Eight Bridges for inviting me to participate in these mini conversations. Um, I'm so excited to do so. And I just wanted to share that in some of these conversations in, in preparation for today, I have been so, um, genuinely impressed by the energy and the passion, um, the focus on community care brought to this moment by, um, by you uh, here in the Bay Area. And, you know, it's felt so hard for some of us to act in this moment, but in fact, there's so much going on and there's so much uh, to look forward to. And let's just celebrate for a moment that we can all gather today and nobody had to sit in traffic. Um, so with that, Sophia, why don't you join me and we'll get started. Hi, Sophia. Hey, Lauren. Hi. Hi. I'm well, thanks. Thanks for doing this with us. Great yeah. to see you. I am delighted. And I think it's, it's great to start with you. You know, you're a representative of Phillips Auction House, which I think is sort of an outlier um, in, in the program a little bit. And we don't really think of auction houses as necessarily playing a role in a local art market, but in fact, it can you know play an extremely important role. So can you can you talk about the role of uh, Phillips in energizing our local market here? Sure. Um, so my role here in the Bay Area as the representative for Phillips is essentially to bring the full breadth of Phillips expertise to our market. This means helping sellers sell, buyers buy, whether that's at auction or via private sales, um, valuing art and offering appraisals to anyone who needs one, and driving partnerships with local institutions and initiative, uh, initiatives much like A Bridges. Um, so I'm lucky in that I get to work with and support virtually everyone in our local art world orbit, um, collectors, advisors, dealers, museums, um, it's one of the reasons I love what I do so much because it's incredibly dynamic. 
And Phillips is unique too in this space and that we're the only auction house to focus exclusively on art from the 20th and 21st centuries, um, which means our team maintains a very active pulse on what's happening in the current market now, both locally and globally. Um, and we have quite an impressive track record of introducing many artists to auction, some big names like Mark Bradford. Um, but even in our most recent contemporary sales in New York, we had 10 artists that were brand new to auction. Um, and this is meaningful because the industry looks to the auction houses to gauge the health of the, health of the overall market. Um, and you want the auctions to do well. It's, it's good for everyone. And what, what specifically was the role in Phillips in um, Eight Bridges? Sure, so Phillips is an official sponsor of Eight Bridges and we're supporting philanthropically. Each month, um, the platform spotlights an important Bay Area nonprofit and Phillips is essentially leading the charge there with an initial give to each of those beneficiaries each month. So for our inaugural, inaugural month of October, it was MOAD here in San Francisco. Um, in November, it was Creative Growth in Oakland. In December, Headland Center for the Arts in Marin. And this month we're featuring Tipping Point. I love that coming together to support um, the small small nonprofits uh, in the area. You know, they're, they're small, but play such an important role in the ecosystem of the arts here. Um, I wanted totally. to- Totally. Oh. No, I was just gonna say it's, that's part of the mission of Eight Bridges too, is to shine a light on the important work that some of these guys are doing. And I think um, creative growth is a good example. I don't know if you all read um, the article that was featured in the New Yorker on them, but it was incredible. And that was the inspiration behind featuring them as a beneficiary. I wanted to ask, you know, I don't want to focus on challenges too much, but I do want to ask um, if there are any challenges during this past year that have maybe changed or reinforced, uh, reinforced your mission both at both at Phillips and, and personally? Sure, um, many, as we all know, but I think also within that, a lot of silver linings. Um, personally, I feel it's brought many of us in the industry closer together here locally. Eight Bridges is a manifestation of that. Um, and at Phillips, we're a contemporary auction house. So everything we do is very much focused on the now and the next and on innovation. Um, it's interesting, actually, when you think about it, the auction model, you know, has been around since ancient times and a large part of that magic that auctions can cultivate and generate is a result of gathering large amounts of people and potential bidders in one room, which uh, obviously was not possible last year. Um, so to translate that experience to a digital realm was not an easy feat, but I do think that Phillips was able to do it quite flawlessly and seamlessly, mostly because we had many of the pieces already in place, right? The art market is more global than ever. And in order to service the broadest number of people, um, we were already you know, enabling collectors to live stream our auctions and bid right from their mobile devices. So there were a lot of tools already there in the foundation that I think allowed us to um, you know, to really meet the moment. And in many ways, I think 2020 just was a sort of catalyst for this di digital innovation, which is great. And is some of that gonna, gonna carry forward? Definitely. The digital world is, is here to stay, um, certainly. What are you looking forward to uh, in this coming year? to seeing more art in person again, to going back um, into the museums. I think um, specifically, I'm super excited for the upcoming Joan Mitchell retrospective that's starting here in San Francisco at SF MoMA, um, which will hopefully include an incredible masterpiece that Phillips was um, very lucky to sell last month. And hopefully you'll all have the chance to see it in person here um, in SF later this year. And Sort of on a personal note, you, you grew up in the Bay Area, correct? I did. I'm a Palo Alto native. <laughs> so how has, um, I mean, I, myself as well, actually, I grew up in San Jose, moved away and then came back. How has coming back been for you? You know, how have you found the art scene here since returning? Um, 
it's been it's been an incredible homecoming. It feels so good to be um, to be back. The art world has changed tremendously here. I think my favorite example of this, and I love that Liz Sullivan is speaking after me, but um, the space that Pace Gallery is in down in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. next door to that used to be Didums, which is a party store that was my first job as a kid. So I grew up, you know, blowing balloons there and stuff. And now that there's an international gallery right next door, I think that in itself is um, a very good example of how much has changed in this area. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I found coming back is, you know, it's such a close tight knit community here that in some ways coming to the Bay Area, it, it was hard to navigate, but now with platforms like Eight Bridges, there's so much more information and there's just so much accessibility to all of the things that are going on right here. Yes. I, I'm a curator. You're sitting in front of a, an amazing piece of art. Can you tell us what it is? Sure, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, this is a painting by Johnny Abrams, who um, is a wonderful artist and human being. Uh, the first time I saw his work was in a group show in New York, and um, it literally stopped me in my tracks. I hunted him down after that, and he very sweetly invited my husband and I to his studio. At that time, it was in New York. Um, he's now living and working in London. Um, but uh, we shared a small pot of green tea, and he's just um, the most thoughtful, wonderful human being. And I think a lot of that you can kind of see in his work. It's it's deceptively simple, but there's such um, a meticulousness and kind of carefulness and thoughtfulness in everything he does. Um, and it's fitting actually, because he has a show up right now at Romer Young here in San Francisco. Um, and a couple of his works are featured on Eight Bridges. So you can see them in person um, and online. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sophia. and. We will, we will circle back and pick up some of the many threads of these conversations. See you soon. Thanks, Lauren. And Daphne, will you join me? Unmute. Yep. Hi. Hi, unmute. It never really gets old. How are you, Lauren? I am doing well. How are you? I'm very well. I, I did travel in a little traffic today, but it was mostly on a windswept clear Bay Bridge. So, um, but I was really thinking about yesterday and our panelists and nobody who had to go out in the storm, which was super nice. Yes, which is very nice. And it's great we're getting rain. It is. Um, well, you have a fantastic piece of art on display behind you. Why don't you start by telling us what that is? Absolutely. I couldn't miss the opportunity to, as we're slowly exiting our shelter in place, um, invite you all in to see our new exhibition by Christian Markley. And I'm standing behind a piece called Untitled Concentric Waves or Concentric Circles. I may get that title wrong. Forgive me. I'm nervous. And, um, and this is a, a photograph of a collage that Christian made. The whole exhibition is a series of new work uh, that was completed last year, really a, a reflection of both our current state of mind this past year, but also really transcendent themes throughout human existence of um, dovetailing from uh, Munch's The Scream and thinking about how we can give uh, voice to sound um, through images. Sorry, I'm just gonna unpack that for a minute. Give voice <laughs> to sound through images. Thank you, sorry, I should back up a little bit. Christian Markley is a Swiss artist who um, was actually born in, in San Rafael. And so is, he's, he's kind of identified as both a Californian and Swiss artist. And uh, many of us in the Bay Area may have seen his really iconic work called The Clock, which was one of the last installations at SF MoMA in 2013, uh, right before the museum closed for construction. It was really a spectacular piece. If you can imagine, it's a little bit difficult to describe, but it was a 24 hour cinematic collage where he, his background as a DJ was applied to the making of the film where he sampled uh, clips from across cinematic history to splice together a, a narrative to watch the passing of time. So if you can visualize this, it was like nine o'clock and in Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise looks at his watch and then it cuts to 
Bambi or something, you know, a Disney film that remarks it's 902 and then cuts to Casablanca and Ingrid Bergman says it's 903 and Humphrey Bogart says you've got to get on that plane. And, and so it, it goes like that for an entire 24 hours. And the remarkable thing about SF MoMA's installation was that they opened the museum up on the last weekend. Uh, they did it throughout periodic times of the exhibition, but they kept the museum open for 24 hours. So it really invited a, a big party and gathering, which is also central to Christian's practice. And in this case, this body of work is an extension of uh, collages he makes from comic books, uh, where he is fascinated by the language that makes you say a sound in your mind. So the onomatopoeia quality of comic books. And in this case, and I might just take you on a little tour if I may, um, to see some of the other works. Oh, Forgive great. me, we're on an iPad, so I'm gonna go a little bit slowly. Um, where you can see that he is creating this silent scream graphically, um, but it's up to the viewer to make these associations in your mind. This is another really wonderful collage. We're gonna go very slowly to get in here and see, but um, there are all these wonderful words in comic books that make sounds like shri and rah, and I won't play them out for you on in the microphone, but <laughs> the point is, is <laughs> if anyone loves comics or, or, or you know, um, video games or any of these, these different things, how there's this visualization of sound, which is something that Christian has been really interested in throughout his career. Um, what I really like about them, I can kind of turn around as well, pardon me, is that, um, for example, this is another really great, great image. Um, so where you can see there is this visually sonic quality, even though there's no sound being played. How, I mean, how extremely cathartic and appropriate for the moment. Um, have you, the show just opened? Have you had some people come through? And I'm curious what people's reactions have been. Thank you. The show just opened. In fact, we finished installation the day after inauguration. So because we are still in shelter in place here in the Bay Area officially, um, we have been open by request. We've been lucky to be able to invite people in um, but as soon as the shelter in place orders are lifted for San Francisco, we'll be open for appointments. And what we found in this time is that even if we're able to change the exhibition and shoot installation views, we're able to bring uh, our audience into the space. And it's your, thank you for mentioning catharsis. I think this is, uh, I received a question yesterday about would this show have been made if we didn't just go through this last year together? And I think we would. I, this is not just a reflection of the COVID era, but rather kind of, um, I was thinking about the scene in Network where, you know, everybody opens the window and screams that I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. But just this idea that, that um, we live in anxious times and how to uh, articulate that. And, and also, I think collectively, once we are all able to gather together, we might all have to go into the street and have a have a big group, group hurrah and a group scream because you know we've all been holding on to so many things and it'll be great to let it all out when we can gather together and have a really big celebration. I mean, I, I know it's one of the things that brings us all together that we love about art is that it can express these emotions. And I mean, I can't imagine a better piece to be living with right now, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Well, it's also, I just wanna say that the fact that the show is on the walls is no small feat. Shortly as before we were to begin creating, Christian is now, though he's Swiss, based in London. And mm -hmm. he, we were, we almost didn't make it because the crate shop as, as the UK was going into lockdown themselves, the, the crate shop was closing down. And so the fact that they are here is really uh, very special. And I think also what's exciting is although I don't wish this global moment on us ever again, the fact that we are as human beings collectively experiencing the same thing, everything, everywhere in the world, it is moving that Christian taps into that and really, really highlights that collective emotion that we're all going through, but also we're going to move beyond. I'm really excited for that. Mm -hmm. I wanna kind of pivot and ask you about um, the gallery's specialization in photography, which you know has a, a very rich history here uh, in the Bay Area, Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lange, you know, so, so many. Um, 
and I, I'm interested in, in working with contemporary artists like Mark Clay, for example, who perhaps, I, I don't know if he calls himself a photographer at any point, but you know, the, the use of photography has expanded uh, so much. So how, how, you, how you approach that? Oh, and I also, I'm sorry, I also wanted to mention that I got to see the show that just came down, the Wardell Milan uh, exhibition, which was so fantastic and something like something soul soothing about seeing artwork in person with such uh, that has such texture and such surface, um, which you know I don't I don't always get from straight photography. So anyways, I, I just wanted to uh, hear you talk some about the, the way the gallery approaches the medium. Thank you. I, well, let me backtrack a little bit again. Um, the Sorry, gallery no, was founded. No. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm thrilled that you asked it because Christian's work is a perfect and really fertile place for us to um, have this conversation. Um, the gallery was founded in 1979 by a remarkable 24 year old Jeffrey Frankel. And he was shortly thereafter joined by the one of a kind Frisch Brandt who have been partners um, for over, over three decades. And, and it's quite remarkable. Um, in when the gallery was founded in 1979, the photography market was still coming into its own and photography in large part was not considered a high art by many institutions, let alone um, the market itself, it was really still, still evolving. And, but Jeffrey and Frisch recognized very early on that photography is just a tool in an artist's kit. It's not, it doesn't belong on its own. It's a part of the greater art historical canon. And, and so the artists that you mentioned certainly blaze trails and the Bay Area does have a really wonderful, rich tradition um, about photography, you know, connected to photography, but what I think really connects and makes it special in this area is our relationship to technology and also our embrace of innovation. And so photography as it has gained wider recognition as a, as a fine art and also as a part of our normal way of communicating. Now, I think there's no question that photography is part of our mainstream. In fact, I would argue almost that photography becomes more part of our, uh, of our language than any other art form. Um, or besides video perhaps. And so what's exciting is to have watched that evolution and, be, and to have been a part of it. To your question about Christian, um, Jeffrey and Frisch, when they first encountered, they've been fans of his work for a long time. And when they first got to work with him, he approached them about uh, showing his photographs, which he, in addition to making um, sculpture, installation, multimedia works, he also is a quite accomplished photographer and really kind of a collector of images and that, body of work ended up being, even though it, it was the initial discussion they had, I think if I'm getting my history correct, I think their third exhibition where we showed his photographs formally. But as you can see, and in fact, I'm gonna take you on the road a little bit as I chat with you, um, because I want to show you this, the film that's a part of the exhibition. Um, photography and its relation to other media is so important. Um, and so pardon me, we're just gonna line up for this collage, this video collage. Um, and so we really, our mission at the gallery is to bring photography into that, into dialogue with other media. And thank you so much for mentioning Wardell's show. Wardell Milan was our previous exhibition that opened last November and just closed. Wardell is an artist whose background is both in painting and photography. And he says that his practice he often the two disciplines are in, in debate with each other and then it's difficult for him to siphon one out. And so this idea that you can be an artist but that you don't have to be specifically in one category is really central to our mission here at the gallery. And, um, and this is a wonderful work to give you an example of or to demonstrate that, that thesis. Um, you can see that this is uh, a film but what it is really is an animation of different collage elements from comic books that Christian has created um, this really beautiful looped animation. But within the loop, you'll see there's a beautiful narrative of kind of the world on fire and certainly something that we felt deeply here in the Bay Area in the past six months, but it's also about existence. And so it isn't necessarily specific to a time and place. And even if we felt like the world has been both literally on fire in the Bay Area, Bay Area but also on fire in so many domains, um, it's also beautiful. And so there's this tension in the work and it's also 
if you, I know that it, you can see it on the screen, but to see it in person, it's quite, is much more beautiful than this wonderful Zoom camera. And um, I really am so looking forward to inviting all of you who are watching in to see it in person once we can gather safely again. Thank you so much, Daphne. We're definitely all looking forward to coming to see it. Thanks so much. And we'll Thank circle you. back later. Uh, and next up is Chris. Hi, Chris. Oh, hi. How are you doing? I'm, I'm feeling good today. Good. Yeah. When we, so we talked uh, a little bit the other day, sort of in advance, in advance of this preparation, and you said a phrase about embracing the unknown of this moment, which has stuck with me. And I would love to hear you just kind of by way of introduction, talk about that phrase. What does that mean? Oh, embracing the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, it means to maybe explore something new, something you might not have thought of, something you might be afraid of. Um, and also working collaboratively with other people, doing more outreach. Uh, I mean, I feel that because so many people are at home in front of their computers or not going out. There's, there's definitely ter territory to explore on new ways to engage with your audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, collaboration has sort of been at the heart of your program um, for a while, right? You have, could, could you talk about that some? Uh, yeah, we, um, we've collaborated with many galleries and in many different ways. Uh, I mean, most obvious one is that we have at all gallery as a neighbor. Um, we asked them to join us in our building a few years ago, and we love having them next door. They're, they're great neighbors and it creates more of a destination for visitors. So, Right now, we're only open to the public on Fridays and Saturdays by an appointment system um, that's available on our website and at all's website. And then when you make that appointment, you get to see both galleries in that time slot. Great. That's a, I think that's a great system. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's worked out really, really well. And so people who are very familiar with our program are discovering their program and vice versa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if I made an appointment now, what would I get to see? Um, good question. <laughs> well, I know what you would see here at our gallery. I don't know the name of the artist next door yet. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to say that. <laughs> no, but in your space, what, what would we oh, see? in our space. <laughs> that was a gotcha question. <laughs> um, in our space, we have an exhibition that will open to the public this weekend called Sea Change. And it's an exhibition in collabor collaboration with a gallery from Los Angeles called Nonaka Hill. And the genesis of the show is we had intended to do a joint booth together at the Fog Fair um, this year. And the fair was canceled. And we thought, well, let's continue with this collaboration, but let's do it in the gallery and in a very, very expanded way. And so right now we have, I think about 90 objects in the gallery, um, wow. lots of Japanese ceramics, um, artists from within our program and a few artists outside of the program. And that's what we have here. It's, it's a really great show and I'm excited to share it with people. And that's a fantastic example of embracing the unknown, pivoting your, your co-organized booth into an expand 90 object exhibition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's been exciting. And it's also, um, it's also given us an opportunity to work very closely with another gallery and their program and kind of putting trust within each other about what's gonna be on display. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had, I think 10 crates arrive from Japan um, with many, many objects that we had never seen before inside and uh, yeah, it was like Christmas. <laughs> How exciting. Yeah. Um, your, I think we, we talked some about how your, your program has been really committed to 
long-term support for you know a specific group of artists and you you add to your roster but somewhat slowly could you talk about the value of that sort of long-term support and relationship for your project yeah i think i think for me it really is about like you said moving very slowly and developing a deep relationship with an artist and not only with the artist, but also with um, the support that comes from behind them, from behind them, like curators that show the work or collectors who buy the work and, you know, collected depth. And I really love to see an evolution of an artist's work over time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think you can definitely see that when you see consecutive exhibitions by an artist every two or three years, you can see the development of the practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in terms of working slowly, yeah, we work pretty slowly when we add to the program. Um, no, it's, it's, I take our, we take our time. We like to look, we like to think, debate, talk and watch, and then um, move when it seems appropriate. You know, we want it to be a, uh, a two-way relationship where not only is the artist someone that we're you know, we're working for, but we also want to hang out with them and be friends with them and be engaged on many levels. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of relationship in some way is made possible by the, the character of the Bay Area, kind of the, the close knit communities here? Do you think that's impacted it? I think so. You know, San Francisco also moves very slowly. Um, <laughs> and it, it's certainly, gives you the opportunity to spend more time with each other, um, watch the seasons pass. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the benefits that I've found of um, the appointment only system right now is you get to actually have long and engaged conversations with, you know, with you when I visit the gallery instead of the, you know, the quick pop in where I've got 10 other things to do. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I think it's pretty special when you get an entire gallery to yourself to for half an hour and you can not only engage with who's ever working there and speak with them, but also with the works. I mean, I think we talked about how I really believe there is no replacement for the in-person experience mm -hmm. of seeing something. And, you know, unfortunately over the past year, we're engaging with everything online, but it's so much more rewarding to see something in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had our, um, our spring show last year was Eddie Martinez and Sam Moyer, which was supposed to open in late March, which ended up, which ended up opening in July. Um, and so when we were finally able to start sharing it with people by appointment, um, people were so thankful and excited to actually finally see a piece of art in person because they've been forced to just engage digitally. Yeah, it's the, the time and the space to see work. Somehow, you know, our experience of time has shifted somewhat over the last year. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed me anyways, it's allowed me to engage differently with work um, that it is, you know, about this looking over a long period that this is the goal to look not just a checklist of things you know to get through which i think it has been really inspiring for me um could could you talk a little bit about that piece behind you there oh um this is a painting by a japanese artist named kyoko murase uh, she's an artist that i've admired for many 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 years and she participated in our previous exhibition, which was called Without Stopping, which brought together the work of nine painters from around the world, well, actually predominantly the US and Japan. Mm. Um, and that's the painting. If you could characterize your program, uh, can you characterize your program for us? Is there a particular kind of artist who you're working with? Um, obviously the program has changed and shifted over the years. Um, you know, if I had my way, I would just show squares and circles and triangles, <laughs> different iterations of it. Um, but um, I would say um, we tend to work with artists who create very immersive installations. 
Um, it's something that I really like. I've worked in me museums for many, many years. And I love that. Uh, I love the whole process of creating exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you really see that here with some of the more ambitious video installations that we've done. Mm -hmm. You know, multi-projections, rooms painted dark, carpets, big sound systems. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard to describe how the program in, in a few words, but really it just reflects my interests. Mm -hmm. I, th I mean, I think an idiosyncratic program is a, is a perfect program <laughs> to have. And I, I appreciate your, you know, you're talking about sort of doubling down on the physical experience of the work that, um, you know, not everything can be translated into this, this digital sphere that we now live in. So allow giving us space to appreciate the, those physical encounters more. Definitely. I feel like a lot of us have digital fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, as we slowly open up, I encourage everyone to go out and visit the galleries if and when you can um, and, and see things. You know, people are mounting exhibitions at this time and it's you know, I think San Francisco City, also the East Bay too, you know, we have galleries in both places, also the South Bay Pace. Um, and it's a small enough city or area where you can, you know, see everything in a matter of days. Mm -hmm. With that, everyone, you know, get out there, make your appointments. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. And as Chris mentioned, Pace in Palo Alto. Next up, Liz. Hi. Hi, Liz. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Excellent. So Pace is, you know, this international powerhouse. I think there's seven or eight locations around the world. Um, what is it, or is there something particular about uh, working in the Bay Area arts community? I mean, it, it's interesting how we got here because I would have never expected, I mean, I've always expected to be in New York all my life, but um, when we did a pop-up out here, it just kind of arose kind of organically and it was just pretty amazing. You know, we started with a pop-up in Menlo Park at an old, um, I'd say old Tesla car dealership. And we did three exhibitions and it was just, it was really wonderful opening it up to the community and just like the outpour of people that just really loved it. And then as time went on, you know, we developed, uh, we decided to, well, they're actually tore down the space, but we found a space in Palo Alto and we figured we could get more foot traffic and, you know, we've been up and running for five years now, which is really exciting. So it's I think it's just really wonderful. It's such a destination, uh, your space there. I'm one of the things that that makes it stand apart for me is you know visiting Pace in New York, which is also a wonderful space, is not peaceful at all. It is not it is not restful experience. But <laughs> visiting, <laughs> visiting you there, it's you know it's this opportunity for like an engaged conversation and to really sit with the work. Um, I, I agree. Yeah. Speaking of, I see some very meditative restful work behind you. Can you tell us what it is? Oh, yes. So I'll start with this. So, <laughs> as you can see, this this is the one piece that has gotten us through the pandemic right now. It's a James Terrell piece. It's a um, one of his medium glass works. And it's a circular shape. And what it does is you see slow variations in color for almost three hours. So it's a very meditative, beautiful piece. And as you know, you know, James Trill is part of the light movement in California. And, you know, I've worked with him for many years and he just amazes me all the time. It never stops. Mm -hmm. So, and then on the other side, across from the Terrell, if you can see, this is a Tara Donovan pin work. And she calls these her, uh, she actually calls them drawings, even though it is actual little dress pins that she has morphed into shapes and they kind of fade in different directions. Um, she also has a big show in New York right now, which is phenomenal. I've only been able to FaceTime with her, but it's really amazing, so. So on your, yeah. on your days off, you come and sit in front of that Terrell and just- Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I really need to uh, mellow out, I just sit there. <laughs> We've been here a few times on the weekends at night just to really look at it. It's really wonderful. And is your is the space open right now? Do you have an exhibition on view? 
Yes, so we, we are open, of course, by appointment only, and we're open on uh, Tuesdays through Saturday. And right now we have a Kenneth Nolan exhibition up and we're showcasing his uh, flare works. And this was kind of the last body of work that he did and they're extremely sculptural works, but the show is really wonderful. And what's exciting about it too, is these works that he did, which they're in their early nineties, um, they are, um, he actually did them while he was living in California. In, it was around the Santa Barbara area that he was living. So it kind of brings everything together in this really wonderful way. Oh, that's great. And that, that exhibition just opened? It did. We, um, we installed it, I think it was last week. Time kind of goes so quickly that I forget. <laughs> but it was, it was last week we installed it. So, and it looks great. Um, and uh, we'll have this up till February. And then after that, we're going to do a show with Arlene Checkett. And we're showing a lot of her, these new sculptural works she did, which are fantastic. So it's going to be a really great show. And you'll be able to walk around the sculptures. And I think she's going to make paint the walls a really exciting color. So it will be very, you know, uplifting to see. And then after that, we're doing a wonderful show with Damien Loeb, um, who does these amazing paintings um, based on uh, pictures from NASA. So they're of the planets, Mars, um, the moon. So that will be really exciting too. So we've got a really great lineup and we're really excited. I mean, we wish people could come more in and, you know, the artists I think really want to be more engaged and come, but it's just, soon i i hope so <laughs> yes we all are all hoping for soon yes um you know lots of galleries have been talking about needing to shift to digital platforms in a way and rethinking kind of digital strategies around for engagement but it's something that i think pace has been doing for quite a while um i'm thinking about the that recent the app that was done as part of the picasso exhibition that you had recently for example um, are there more kind of projects like that that are that are coming up that you can tell us about? Um, well, well, first of all, I'll just talk about the online platform with Pace has been going on for a while and they've been doing tons of different things. Like this morning, they had a wonderful talk um, about Tara Donovan's new works and they kind of took you on a little exploration of her show in case you're not able to go in person. And I think they're really keeping that going. So it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And I know they haven't been, they were kind of open for a while and they were closed. So the online platform has been really, really important to everyone and the artists too. So it's been really exciting. And, you know, also being part of this Eight Bridges is, is super wonderful. I mean, it keeps us all together as a community, which I think is very important. You know, it's it's been very different working out here from New York in the sense that, I mean, New York is much bigger and there's tons of galleries, but um, here I think, you know, everyone really supports each other in a wonderful way. And it's it's really been just such a wonderful experience. Um, has I'm curious about working with artists who are you know not not local so the artists who a lot of whom you're working with are, are far away and you know clearly experience from the audience perspective is we can't travel to new york to see exhibitions there has your the way that you work with artists during this past year has it shifted at all oh it definitely has like for example i work really closely with james and you know now we're on zooms all the time i can't you know quite go to flagstaff so <laughs> it's been very different i'm a little tired of the zoom but <laughs> i'm you know you have to embrace it because it's really the only way to you know get through these things but in the end i think we've all like you know had to change different you know like approach things differently but we keep things going and i think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. and you know, the Zoom is wonderful because you can actually see each other and, you know, kind of do things. It's just a little harder, but it definitely works. <laughs> I can only imagine talking to Terrell over Zoom and having him try to explain one of these pieces. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does, a, he does a great job. <laughs> so it, it, it all works out. So, and I think, you know, with, with exhibitions, you know, it's been a little more difficult, like deciding like where, you know, things are going like, but Leo was a perfect example. He was the first person like we put up during the pandemic. And, you know, he was the first one to come out and it was really, it was actually wonderful because he did a great talk about his show. He actually was able to show all the works and also he was in his studio. So he was able to actually really pinpoint certain things he wanted about the exhibition. And even though people couldn't come, it was really actually wonderful. And then I had a few, um, uh, schools approach us about if we could do their art classes here, which 
I thought was like the best idea ever. So what they did is they brought someone in and then taped me and the kids asked questions about the works and we went around the whole gallery. And it was just, it was really wonderful. And I think it was really engaging for the children too, you know, to ask questions about the art and it gets their mind off of things and, you know, a different exploration in their art class, so. Oh, that's fantastic. I, you know, I, I love involving kids in uh, art and really, I guess impressing or you know teaching them at, a, at an early age about the value mm -hmm. and um yeah the value of artists and artistic practice so yeah i asked a lot of questions some i couldn't even answer <laughs> that's great <laughs> kids are smart <laughs> exactly <laughs> lots smarter than you think <laughs> well thank you so much liz thank you yeah good to see you you too and then last up we have sarah Sarah, are you? I'm here and I can't, this, the host has stopped my video. So, well, there we, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Hi. How, How are, are you? you? I'm doing well. <laughs> well, this is so fun and it's just been so amazing listening to everybody. And I have to say, I've learned, I mean, I've learned a lot on this, but I had no idea that Christian Markley was a California artist. So Daphne, amazing to learn that it's, and his show, you know, I think like the, the clock, I remember in New York where there was a three hour line around the block. Um, and so anyway, it's very interesting to know that he's a California native. Oh yeah. There, I mean, there's such a strong artistic legacy here that, I mean, constantly surprises me as well, which is what's so amazing about the quirky scene that we have here. That's awesome. So Sarah, you, uh, founded a technology company. And so obviously this, this current moment of um, where we all are so reliant on technology is something that is not a surprise <laughs> to you. Uh, as we move, you know, we're, we're meeting now on a, on a virtual platform. How many of these sort of adjustments that have been made uh, for this moment are gonna stick uh, post COVID? Yeah, no, I mean, it's so funny. I was reflecting on, so literally this time last year, I was on a panel at FOG um, about collecting in the digital age. And well, it's like deeply ironic, sort of the, the shift that we've had. And, you know, in a way it feels like COVID kind of ripped off 86 mandates in the art world. Uh, we all wanted to go to, we all knew that we kind of needed to move into a digital framework. The necessity wasn't there. How do we do it? You know, we were, caught up in our day to day and, and COVID kind of accelerated us into the future. And, you know, one of the, the things that has been so inspiring about Eight Bridges is Eight Bridges really came about as a need, um, not because everybody felt like they needed to be online, but it actually was a need of staying together, um, collaborating, knowledge sharing. You know, this really came out of the early days of COVID of what is going on how is our industry shifting? And, you know, August last year, it was kind of like, let's actually move this into an online platform that everybody can, can really engage with. And, you know, I think that's been a really inspiring thing. And for Lobus, you know, our mission has always been about putting people in control of their information, right? And that means digitally. Um, and that became very critical during this last year where, it, people were fragmented, you know, they were all of a sudden um, separated from their servers and their paper files and their libraries. And, you know, we did some really meaningful and important work where, you know, we were really, we partnered, we were able to partner with Cap Street and David Ireland, right, and help them move their archives into a digital database. We worked with a whole host of art advisors who were now all of a sudden in this you know, remote working environment and they were getting 500 PDFs uh, a month and art fairs and auction links and really being able to show that in one dynamic place where they could actually talk to their clients and collaborate. And we had some families that were going through estate planning issues um, and had to catalog works in a remote situation. So this is all, you know, we talk about a digital experience and, you know, I think the thing that I'm really excited about is I think it's a hybrid. You know, I think we're forever in this hybrid model. Um, 
nothing replaces being in person. You know, we are all in this world because we love physical objects and human connection um, and relationships. But, you know, how does the sort of infrastructure, digital infrastructure behind that make all of our lives just a little bit easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder how kind of lessons of this this time are going to carry forward. And I mean, I made the joke early about traffic, but, you know, traffic is a hindrance to gathering. So <laughs> how much of this, this gathering online is going to continue and how it's going to continue to change? Well, totally. And I, you know, one of the talks that I'm really, that really caught my eye in this sort of eight for this week was one that Pamela Walsh is doing with um, one of her artists based Craig Waddell out of Sydney. And so we never would have had an experience before where I would be sitting in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I could hear a talk with a gallerist in Palo Alto who is connecting to their artist in Sydney. And it is, I think that's a really powerful mechanism. And, you know, another anecdote to share was, you know, I'm on the board of the, new, the Noguchi Museum in New York. And we had our benefit this year. And, you know, many institutions were wrestling with what does that look like? How do you kind of stay connected? And we really decided to lean in to what it was like being on a digital platform. And we had, you know, typically the event is a couple hundred people because the capacity of the museum is not that high. Um, it's, you know, honoring great sort of visionaries in the field, but you never get to like hear from them. They do a little introduction and then they're at their table. And this year, you know, it was David Age and Sai Kuo Gong and it was an hour of like hearing them and talking to them. And, you know, we had many, many, many more people that were able to participate in that. And those are the things I think that are really, really exciting to see. Yeah, that, I mean, these platforms that connect us to you know, Apebridge is both, it, it connects our Bay Area scene to this global market, right? We can, people outside the Bay Area can now very quickly get a glimpse of what's going on here without having to travel. Correct. And when you think about technology, how does, how does this kind of virtual space um, support local? How, how does it, how does it, uh, do I have a question coming out of this? Yeah, no, I think, well, I think you're picking up on something that's really interesting. I mean, I think with eight bridges, we, you know, what we are seeing, and this goes from the talks that we had, we, we have high participation from California, obviously, um, but from San Francisco and LA, from Texas and from New York, and then actually some representation sort of throughout the country. And like, that's incredible. You know, you wouldn't be able to, you don't get that um, in a purely sort of analog physical environment. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, I think that like sort of the industry is seeing that across the board. Um, engagement is, you know, has spiked. Like, I think you, there was a survey that was out there that said there's a 59% of people have like had an increased engagement with their collecting um, because of, of COVID and I think these platforms of discovery now, and I very much believe it, nothing replaces in person, but I think there's a supplemental element to discovering, right? Is it on Instagram? Is it on websites? Is it through these sorts of chats? Um, you know, the art world is long, we all get questions on how do I participate, right? How do I learn? How do I start collecting? And these are all channels and, and platforms to do that. And I think, you know, I am, I know a lot of my colleagues on this call and, and beyond are all really excited about this like movement, this moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I imagine it, it appeals to a younger demographic too, people who are digital natives and really used to getting information through all of those platforms that you mentioned um, is, a, is a different group than the, the traditional gallery or museum goer. Completely. And I, you know, the, we're seeing on eight bridges that the biggest segment is millennials, um, which is, you know, really exciting. Sotheby's cited that 30% of their buyers 
were under the age of 40. Now, like, are they the ones that are driving top sales? You know, that question is, I think that's, that's not what that statistic is about, but I think it's a widening of, of interest and participation um, that is, you know, I think really, really excited to see. It, yeah, and it just underscores sort of the collaborative participatory nature of what the art scene is. Yeah. Um, can you, so you're, you're, you were very involved in building sort of the Eight Bridges platform. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned about the specificities or the quirks of the Bay Area community by working on that? Well, no, I think it was such an amazing um, thing to be a part of. I mean, obviously I, I have a technology company. We are building technology products every day. What I observed with this is this is very much, and Platform LA and is, you know, is another example of this, is a platform that was built by the industry, right? And we, you know, it was really imagined, it's a Wordspace website. It has gotten modifications over time that are really specific to how this group wants to show their art. And, you know, in my sort of technology conversations, I like to kind of liken this to an Amazon versus Shopify experience, which might be a little esoteric for this group, but basically the art world should have a lot of tools right, to launch a website like this, to make collaboration easier. Um, it's not about having a one size fits all, like that's not how the art industry is gonna work, right? Every, you know, galleries have a very specific perspective. They have a viewpoint, they have a program that is very much a part of their identity and why people collect from them um, and from the artists in that stable. And, Technology needs to be there to supplement that, um, but not to override that experience. That is very well said. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm afraid that we have to we have to stop, um, but I want to invite all of the panelists to come back, show us your lovely faces for a, a rather quick uh, Q and A. And as everyone's coming back on, maybe just to get us started, I'm just gonna kind of throw out a question, picking up on where Sarah and I just ended with the, you know, these changes that are that are gonna stay moving forward. Are there kind of lessons or practices from this past year that you are gonna carry forward in your um, in your respective projects? And this is for everyone, so. I'm happy to jump in. I think being deliberate about time um, and being, you know, and I think harnessing relationships that matter. I think this, the gift of last year showed that we could be very efficient um, with certain sort of engagements and relationships and go deeper on others. So I'm really excited for that new framing. I also wanted to say that I think one, one lesson we really loved, Liz, when you were talking about teaching art to students, I think, or the, the opportunity to speak with an artist in Australia when you live in California, that potential and possibility for education and inviting people who live far away who might never be able to come to San Francisco to offer that opportunity is really, has been so rewarding for us and one that we're really excited to continue going forward. Ask Kelly to jump in here and see if there are any questions from the chat that we wanted to ask the panelists. Hi, everyone. Um, one general question that came in um, is, what does the Bay Area art scene have to offer that other scenes around the United States do not? Or rather, what makes the Bay Area art scene unique? I think Liz hit on it very well. Um, and her sentiment of community and pulling together. And I think Eight Bridges is a really good example of that. And I've, I mean, I've felt this personally having moved back home to California from New York um, pretty recently. I think this is, this is unique to this region. It's incredibly um, collaborative and supportive and I'm super happy to be a part of it. Okay. 
Okay, and one more question. How will this current economic downturn affect the art or gallery scene in San Francisco? Concurrently, would an economic downturn help the voices being expressed in San Francisco? I can touch on that a little bit, zooming a bit out from SF. Um, the art market is incredibly resilient. And I think what we're seeing now is not so dissimilar in a way to what happened in 2008 and nine, where there was um, you know, a bit of a contraction in the market, especially last year when there's so many unknowns, so much uncertainty out there. Um, interestingly, from an auction house perspective, 2020 was actually one of our best years on record in terms of sales, which is incredible and, um, and kind of mind blowing when you think about it. But what that shows is there is incredible demand out there for great works of art. And that I'm talking on a kind of macro global level, but I think that translates you know, to a local level as well. And I think, you know, one thing we talk a lot about at Eight Bridges, but I think we're about to go into, I think coming out of COVID, there's a lot of energy. Um, and there is a feeling that the world is going to really come back in a very dynamic way. And San Francisco has always been on the cutting edge of things, right? That is like in our DNA and in our blood out here. And I think what has been so inspiring to me about the group that has gathered, you know, from fog to the museums that are, and institutions that are here to the gallerists, like we're, this is a pioneering of a new model. And we have this ability to set the course of what does collecting in 2020s, that decade and beyond look like. And I think we're, we're seeing the beginning seed, seeds of that right now. There's one last question that I'd love to get everyone to weigh in on, and then we'll probably have to wrap it up as we're a little over time today. But the question is um, from Matthew, is there a risk that emphasizing the tech side of the Bay Area art scene may have a downside and how to guard against that? And I think the larger question is, you know, as we have all had to shift so much towards um, viewing art on our screens, like what effect does that have, um, negative or positive? I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think that in terms of the tech side, we're really grateful that these tools exist because we were so lucky that the infrastructure was already there and we could just pivot really quickly to being, you know, to doing what we're doing now. And originally with Eight Bridges, when we thought about this week, we thought it would actually be a big push to emphasize the whole community go, to go and see shows in person. Um, but of course, when the shelter in place went into effect, we learned that we would have to all be on Zoom. And while that was devastating to us, uh, we also were grateful that, the, that we could. Um, I think that Sarah's point is really well taken that once we all are able to safely gather again, we might go crazy and you know have wild parties in the streets and see each other all the time and party all night long. But what I think the legacy of that will be is once things go back to some kind of routine where we're familiar with our daily lives and schools and seeing our families and friends is that the opportunity to see an artwork in person can change your life. And so I think one of the things that I want to say from my team and my community is that we invite you to come back and spend time with us. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a whole incredible team at each of these institutions that is here and ready to answer questions and talk to you about your thoughts and feelings and show you more. So if you're ever interested to learn other things about an, a gallery stable or you know different artists we represent, please ask us because it's our job and our great passion to talk about the artists that we represent. So I think we will be adamantly in person as soon as it's safe and that that will be a nice antidote to all of this digital um, Zooming we're doing. And I'm great, well, I'm grateful for seeing all your faces. I know we can't wait to be in person again.
I think that's a great way to wrap up. Thank you so much, Daphne. And th thank you, Lauren, and to all of our panelists today for the insightful conversation. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Please be sure to check out 8bridges.com. That's 8-bridges.com for our special 4x8 Bridges feature this week. There are many more exciting virtual events listed under the calendar. And we hope you all will enjoy browsing and participating in more conversations this week. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out.